to walk closer. You went through the splash section as soon as I took it off. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. So uh, just so you know, this, this is the narrow corridor of the, uh, the camera. So <laughs> you, uh, you have a nice back of your head, and if, you, if it's okay if others see it, that's fine with me. But... Oh yeah, and also for singing, yeah, I was gonna, say, yeah, so, yeah, so you're, yeah, you, you guys have good voices, so if you want to, yeah, so just giving you an awareness so that way, otherwise you're gonna have it where, you know, get out of there. See, this is what happens when the tape comes down, and I was gonna say, I mean, if you're very confident about your singing in the back of your head, that is a wonderful place for you to be, but just giving you a heads up in advance. So, okay, well, and, you know, so, as you're, you're starting to get the, the idea that, you know, we're, we're moved over this way so we can live stream uh, our, our evening service. is gonna be a little bit of a, a work in progress to see, you know, what, what is better for us to, to, uh, to try to have the, the evening style of worship that we're doing here and, or um, to bring the, our recording equipment and bring it all over to the, uh, to the fellowship hall. So, you know, work, work in progress. But uh, before we, we start our worship, does anyone have, you know, good news or things of, of praise from this last week? Oh, that's true. Okay, yeah, so work in progress. Yeah, so we're also trying to, for the sake of live streaming, we don't want personal, people's personal information. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll just not get in the habit of having us do prayers of praise in the beginning. I'm trying, just trying to keep Kat on her toes. But, yeah, so we'll save it. And, and when we do do the, the time of, of prayer, we do have it set up where those are, are muted. So that way, you know, those, those are, are kept private. But, Kathy? Oh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I got a, got a text from, from someone just saying that they're appreciative of the, of the live stream, and it's nice to see technology working, us getting closer and closer to, to doing something professional, but, you know, hello to anyone who's live streaming with us, but, yeah. So, let us begin our, our time of worship with a prayer to the Lord. So, insistent God. By day and night, you summon your slumbering people. So we ask that you would stir us with your voice, enlighten our lives with your grace, that we give ourselves fully to Christ's call to mission and ministry. God, let this time here be building up for this purpose. Make us to be frontier disciple makers so that the lost would be found, and that your son would be glorified. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, let's see. Kiva, do you remember what song you wanted us to sing last week? Our God Reigns. Our God Reigns. Okay. 195. In the gray.
All right. Well, does anyone know the tune for this one? Just, otherwise, we might have to uh, practice that one before. Ah, it's on the That is true. So that was a good picked one, Diva. Thank you. All right. Henny? 197. 197? All right. I'm not good at starting songs. You want to uh, get us started with that one? And he let forth with peace. song. Well, thank you, Hanny. So you're even prepared with the, uh, the tambourine there. That was uh, nice and providential. I think you planned that one. All things bright and beautiful. Okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys to stand. <laughs> That's, uh, you got to you need to show a little more individuality. You can't just wait for me to tell you. Everything. All right. So how do we start this one? All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, he made their tiny wings. 
Thank you. And for your wonderful singing. Okay. And then, if you would, look in your Grace Psalter hymnals as this evening we are looking at Lord's Day 4. Okay, so that is page 864 in the Grace Psalter hymnals. And then I will read for us the, the questions, and then we will recite with the answers together. So Lord's Day 4. But doesn't God do us an injustice by requiring in His law what we are unable to do? No. God created humans with the ability to keep the law. They, however, tempted by the devil, in reckless disobedience, rob themselves and all their descendants of these gifts. Will God permit such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? Certainly not. He is terribly angry about the sin we are born with as well as the sins we personally commit. As a just judge, he punishes them now and in eternity. He has declared, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. But isn't God also merciful? God is certainly merciful. But he is also just. His justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. Okay. So what truths from God's word are taught to us in this Lord's day? Truths that come from Scripture itself, or our summaries of the truth of God's Word. And if you ever at a loss, the good news is the Heidelberg Catechism does come with little notes on the bottom of Scripture verses in which they are getting these ideas from. So, Sienna, did you have something you wanted to say? Ah, I was gonna say that. Say that. Look at me when you say that. Oh yes, that he's terribly angry with the sins that we are born with. Yeah, that's true. That is true. And that it's interesting that there's a, there is a, a difference there between the, the sins we are born with as well as the sins that we personally commit. And what do you guys think about that, that distinction? What, what's the difference between the sins we're born with and the ones that we personally commit? What is that? Why do you think there's that distinction given in the Heidelberg Catechism? Cohen? Yeah, so there's, there's sin that's, that's in us, so we're born with sin, and that makes us desire to do sin. Uh-huh. And do you, do you remember, where, where, did that, where did that sin that, that we're born with, where did that come from? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, yeah. Yeah, Kiva? So, was it Eve and Adam and Eve? Yeah, you're right. Yep, yeah, they, were, they were the first to sin, and because of the sin of Adam... Now we are all born into sin. And so that's where we, we believe that idea of that Adam being the covenantal representative and anyone who belongs to Adam's family feels the curse of his disobedience. And so 
That's uh, where, I can't remember, it was last week or the week before, we, we'd, we had wondered if, if that was part of why Jesus was born of a virgin, so that way he would not have been born of directly Adam's seed, and yet still born of a woman, so that way he was born to be fully human. But, you know, it is interesting to see that, that distinction being made there in the, in the text. So, all right, what else does Lord's Day 4 teach us about God's Word? Yeah. Yep. Yep. We are sinful. God is just, and God is merciful. Yeah. Three three important things, and and because uh, why why might people think that God is not both just and merciful? What do you think, Owen? Yeah. We yep. are not going to see him in the details. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a good description right there. Yeah, because you know, depending on the moment in the Bible, either it seems like God is, is super harsh or super laid back. And, uh, and it kind of hits on, so this is one of those, those you know, from the, one of the later questions of what, what is a, a real daily problem that is addressed with in this Lord's Day. You know, you, you get that, that great, big, scary question for Christians. If God is, is so good, and if God is so powerful, why are there bad things in the, in the world? And you look at it, it's like, okay, well, most people say either, if, if there are bad things in this world, either God must not be just because he's not stopping sin from happening, or, you know, otherwise, you know, you get that problem of, well, maybe he's not merciful, you know, maybe... You know, maybe he's, yeah, because you, you get it that either, you know, he's going to come in and swoop in and he's going to stop everything, and, and if he's going to stop everything, then how can he be merciful if, if, he, if he punishes us, you know, as soon as he gets an opportunity to do so? And so you get this, this question of balance. It's like, okay, we're here in the world. He hasn't crushed us, but, you know, so how does all this justice and mercy work together? And so... That's where we see in, in Scripture, it does declare he is, he's just. Every sin is going to be paid for. He does not let sin go on forever. And yet, he's merciful too. And so this is where we see this, this great big setup for the gospel <laughs> that is going to be coming in the, the later Lord's days. But you know, right now we're just trying to understand that tension, that, that God is able to be both. He's able to be both just and he's also to be able to be uh, a god of mercy and one of the one of the scripture passages that is useful for this is exodus chapter 36 verse 6 it says the lord passed before him and proclaimed the lord the lord a god merciful and gracious slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of their fathers on children and on the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so you have in this, this description, which is understood to be this long name of God that is, is being given here. He's being described as someone who you know, shows abounding, steadfast love and yet also a God who, you know, is going to visit the iniquity of, of the people. 
And yet, in his name, we see both things being declared of him. So, there you go. You get that, that tension. He's both. He's merciful, and he's also wrathful. All right, so you know, what, do, what do we do with that? What, what other things, uh, what, other, what other truths do we see of, of the Bible declared in this Lord's Day? Yeah, Russ? That all of the, 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 the mess in the world is um, it's not God's doing, it's man's doing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. That's a, that is a, a good thing that is, is being made here of uh, the, one of the, the scripture passages that, that came to mind for me this week was James chapter 1, verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt be for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he lured and enticed, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it con- is, has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. And so that, that idea. Hey, right. thanks for joining us. So it's Mr. Stone, right? Yes, sir. All right, excellent. Thank you for coming. Pleasure having you here. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we see this, this idea that it's like with, with a question and answer 12, you know, it's like, okay, well, oops, nope, sorry, looking on the wrong page. Nine, there we go. The, uh, you know, no, number nine, but doesn't God do us an injustice by requiring in his law what we're unable to do? And it's this whole thing, it's like, well, it's like, you know, why is, why is he accusing us? Why is, why is he pointing, shaking that, that finger at us? If he created an impossible law, then why is he able to judge us? And the whole point is that it's like, well, yeah, he, God didn't fail in his creation of us. When God created the world, he created it to be good. It was, it was pure. And yes, you know, he created that, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil there, that that was in the Garden of, of Eden, and so there was that ability to sin, but he also created within Adam and Eve a, a heart and a nature that reflect the image of God, and so that way, you know, they, they could have, they, they were given every means to be able to be righteous, and yet they weren't. So why? Is it because God's original design, did he fail? No, it's because it was our willful disobedience. Or as it, as it says in, in uh, question and answer nine, um, in reckless disobedience. So if, if you grab the, uh, the great Psalter hymnal that it should be there in front of you, yeah, there you go. So what we're studying is on page 864. So and you find that. So what we're discussing, are there are three question and answers that are there on that page. So that is 864. Yeah, so sin is something we can't blame God with. Sin is something that comes from, from you and I. And, uh, yeah. Then another scripture verse that, um, that is referenced in this Lord's Day, Psalm 103, starting with verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will... He keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And so here we see, again, this, this idea of, of this merciful love of God and the fact that he is a God who is slow to anger. Even though we, you know, his, his children, we, we've given him plenty of reasons for him to be angry with us as we've been rebellious, as we continue to break his laws and dishonor his, his name, he's slow to anger. And so we also see this, this idea that... Um, because we get that tension right there. Well, you know, how can he be just and merciful? What we see is this promise that, that he is, is going to 
remove those iniquities from us. So the iniquities are going to be dealt with, and that's going to be through Jesus Christ, and that's what we see in that, that next section of the Heidelberg Catechism, part two of deliverance. But it's the idea that he shows love, and those sins, at least as far as the Old Testament, he's saying, they're going to be dealt with. They're going to be removed. I will pay for them. You can trust me on that. I do not let sin go on forever. I will visit iniquities, but I'm not going to visit them on you. You belong to me. If you fear me, if you are my children, then that sin will be removed from you. And so that's uh, good news for us. Or uh, one of the one of the, the scripture passages that, that shows that, that God does not let sin go on forever. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, it says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so that statement that even though he's a God of mercy, long-suffering, he is a God that will make sure that every sin is paid for. So we're trying to juggle this, this tension here with this Lord's Day. But looking at the, the questions and the answer in Lord's Day 4, why would, this, why would the words of these answers be honoring to, to Jesus or God? Jesus was sitting here with us right now, he, list, hearing us recite these, these answers, what, what, what is it that he would love about it? What would he say? That's me. That's, you're talking about me right there. Cohen? When, when, it's, uh, when, you t when you're looking at number 10, it's saying, well, God permits such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished. Jesus would take pride in that. Yeah. To knowing that he, that he would not let us down. Yeah. No, and, and you are right. That's, that he would take a lot of pride in that. Because sometimes we think like, oh, like, wouldn't it be, you don't want to be the bad guy, right? You don't want to be the bad guy who has to take away everyone's fun, you know? Sin is fun, right? And Jesus, he's going to come in and he's just going to ruin the party. Well, I don't really think about what is the, what is the long-term effect of, of sin? You know, it's suffering, it's, it's death. And, uh, and, and there was one book that, that I was reading, it was a book on, on apologetics, and, and one of the arguments that is brought up is, is when people when people become frustrated with with God as someone who who has a goal to end sin in this world and they see that as being a great big buzzkill they're saying well that's generally what some what people who in the United States are, are more likely to think because we have not actually seen the kinds of evils that most people in the world and most people through history have had to face we live in a very blessed country, and yeah, it's not perfect. There are problems here, but when you've lived a pretty good life, and you think of sins, you think of sins as like, oh, like those, you know, part, the kind of parties we'd go back to when we were, you know, teenagers and in our 20s. Like, is that, is that what Jesus wants to end? Why would Jesus be proud of that? It's like, no, like, if you live in a place where, you know, you're ruled by warlords, if you live in a, in a place where people are going hungry, every day and children are starving because of the way that your your leaders are hoarding and keeping things to them themselves and the way that they're abusing others when you live in places where where violence is is a common thing when you see the kind of hardships that are actually very common in the world and throughout history and you see these evils and it, if you if you try to to paint this picture of a God who wants to end in evil as being a God who wants to be a buzzkill. And their response is like, like no, this, this evil is what takes joy from my life. When, when I've lost family members because of violence, when I have had to put my children to bed without food for the third night in the row because of what my leaders have done, when I've had to go through all this kind of suffering and you want to tell me that is a buzzkill that Jesus wants to come in and end evil? Oh no. What they're begging for, what they're pleading for, is a God, of a hero, of a leader, of a savior, who will put an evil to death because 
evil does not satisfy. We talked about that the, this morning. And so, you know, for Jesus to say that right there, that, that statement of, that's right, I'm going to end all evil. When I come back, there is going to be no more evil left in this world, and this world will be perfect. I'm not going to let the consequence of any sin linger on forever. Every single sin will be paid for because vengeance is mine. That's a good God. That's a good Savior. And so Jesus should be proud of that reality that when he comes, he is going to judge the living and the dead. So, Cohen, that is a, a good point there. That, that Jesus would be proud of the fact that, <laughs> that or just that, that language right there. He is terribly angry. Well, who wants to think of, of an angry God or an angry Jesus? Those who are dealing with the consequences of, of, of sin. So that's a good thing. We, we are proud of the fact that he is angry about our sins. So what else do we, we learn about God or Jesus that they would be happy to hear us proclaim? Yeah, Russ? I think that in, uh, in this Lord's Day, as well as all throughout the Catechism, it's honoring to God the fact that this isn't just somebody's opinion, it's not the way somebody feels about something. I mean, the whole Catechism is so grounded in God's Word. Yeah. And, and there's not a statement in here that doesn't have Scripture, you know, God's Word to back it up. Yeah. I think that's very honoring to the Lord. I would agree with that as well. And that's where I love the fact that they've, they've got all these, these different footnotes in here to show us. And this is where we get it from. And, and so, like with, Lord, with, with the question and answer number 10, you know, we, we see how it even quotes Scripture directly, but even the ones that aren't quoted directly are getting their ideas directly from Scripture, what, which is why I don't see that, you know, we are, by studying the catechism, that we are doing anything less to honoring God's word, but this is just an opportunity for us to see the truth that is declared throughout the, wor the word of God. Right. Some, some things that, that I believe are, are honoring to God, and we touched on this earlier, but the idea that God did not fail in his creation. Now God, God is not a failed designer or creator. That God created this world to be good. And if, if there are problems that we have, they're the problems that we brought into this world, not God. We cannot pin our problems on God. Because when you go back and you look at Genesis chapter 1, his creation was good. And, in, and the, we were able to rest in the goodness of what he had done. We're the ones who brought the thorns and the thistles in the world. John? Amen. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, if if we're the ones who who brought the problems into the world, we can't trust on ourselves to be the ones to to solve those problems. Because if we brought problems into the world when there were no problems in this world, you know, now that we have this massive deficit, well, it makes us think that we're going to be the ones who heal us. So yes, you know, it does require God and Jesus to be the ones who heals us, and that's that is why He's good. We are, we have to work our way back from we are our most men, we are our fellow man's most torment. What's the, what was that last word there? Torment. Most torment. Oh, most. We have to work our way back. Yeah, yeah. Some of those things are Okay, well, that's all right. The, uh, one of the other things that that this Lord's Day reveals to us about God is that he is long-suffering. And, and I think that's, that's a word that is good for us to be able to, to understand that, that, that puts us in this tension of the fact that you know, God is good, God is powerful, and yet there's still sin in this world. Well, why? Because God is so secure that he doesn't have to punish sin immediately. Because every sin that we do, and even if it's a sin between you and I, every sin that, that we do, that it ultimately is an insult to the glory of, of God. And yet he's willing to endure those insults of his glory for a purpose. 
Because if he just punished Adam and Eve and said, oh, you know, this was an experiment, it failed, didn't go the way that I wanted, okay, bye, no, and just ended humanity right then. It's like, we would never, we would, first of all, <laughs> there would be, no more humanity would have been born, and so, you know, there would have been no opportunity for us to be born or for us to be redeemed, and, you know, second of all, you know, we wouldn't have had the, the chance for Jesus Christ to come and to offer redemption for us, and so this is where we were, we were celebrating early this morning with the passage from First Peter that, you know, this was God's plan from, from before the creation of this world, that he created this world because he wanted to have people to redeem. The reason why he waited so long for Jesus to come into this world so that way, you know, the, the message of his coming could be sent throughout the world was because, you know, he wanted to have generations. He wanted to have thousands and millions of people who could hear of the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. He, even Jesus has come, and yet 2,000 years later, here we are, billions of people in the world. Why is God still waiting? Because there are people who have been born, or who have not yet been born, that God still loves them, and God still wants to redeem them and restore them, even though ha they have not been born yet. And so, what does he do? He waits. He waits and he lets the mockery of his glory continue, enduring it, knowing that every sin is going to be paid for and that he is going to come later and he is going to, he's going to end, he is going to pay for all those sins and yet every single person that he loved from before the creations of this world, every single person who he knows by name, knows their inmost being, He's going to wait. He's going to wait for us to come. He's going to create that, those opportunities for us to hear the good news of Jesus Christ so that we can be redeemed. None of that would be possible. Our ability to know Jesus right now, to be able to, say, to, to proclaim his glories, would not be possible if God was not long-suffering. So why does God let evil happen in this world? Because he's tough and he can endure it. And because he's loving and compassionate and wants to restore us. It's really not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, I can see where it's confusing, but it's good. Yes. May our sin abounds and our grace abounds even more. And that is, that is true. And he says, well, shall we go on sinning? By no means. <laughs> Let's not make more opportunities for grace. His grace is enough. But, yeah, it's that, that idea that his, his love is greater than, than all the sins that, that we can bring to him. And uh, I also just like that, the, the truth that, that God is both just and merciful. And he is perfectly both. And he did not want to be a God who was simply just nice. Uh, but he... But through the cross of Jesus Christ, we are able to see that, that God is both fully. He has the fullness of wrath. He totally hates and abhors sin and evil. And talks about him being, being angry. You know, that's true. He is terribly angry. And in the cross, he was able to take all of that anger, every ounce of that anger towards our sins, and pour it out on his own son, Jesus Christ. And yet by pouring out all of that anger on his son, he was also given the ability to show us mercy. And so that's one of the things that, I, I, I don't have a Bible verse that backs this one up, so this just comes from my own noggin, which probably doesn't make it reliable, but, but I, I've often thought that the cross of Jesus Christ is the one historical moment in which we see the fullness of God's wrath and the fullness of God's mercy on display together. Because otherwise, when you look through the Bible, you see moments of wrath, you see moments of mercy, and you know, through his dealings with people, he is, he's both, he continues to be both, but one action perfectly fulfilled both wrath and mercy. So like I said, that one's from my own noggin, so take it with a grain of salt, but you know, it makes me, that thought makes me love the cross of Jesus Christ more, and help me to understand this idea of why would God allow sin in the world at all? 
Because the cross is so beautiful. There is nothing else in this world like what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And so he set up this world knowing that he is going to have this long suffering of our sin, doing all of it just to bring us all to the cross. So, I said, take it for what it's worth, but it makes me love the cross. So, let's think what, what, are, what are some of these real world problems that are helped? by these questions and answers from Lord's Day 4. And I've already hit on that, that idea of if God is so good and so powerful, why is there sin in this world? So to address that one. So this is the, the encouragement for... Uh, Doing a little homework before you come. Because you got all the notes before you come there. And the, uh, the goal of what we're working on here is uh, making it so that way you, you all feel comfortable enough, and including me, but all of us here feel comfortable enough talking about the, the Word of God and using this as, as a study tool. So part of this is trying to be accountability for you guys. I know, this, this question, question can be a little complex, though, so it's not too much chastising right there, but I'm trying to think. Does anybody have uh, an idea of real-world problems, daily things that we face that has helped with this? All right, well, I've got some to share, but the, uh, I'm, I'm really trying not to go into... The, uh, the pastor mode where I do the preaching. I, I love listening to what you guys have to say. Um, but one, one, of the, one of the things that I see that is in culture today that is addressed with this is the argument of, it's not my fault God made me like this. Has anyone heard an argument like that before? Yeah, just being like, you know, or, or even if it's not pointing the finger at God that it's God's fault, that, that I'm like this. Maybe, maybe they're pointing the finger at someone else. It's, you know, it's, it's my parents' fault. It's the government's fault. It's, you know, it's this person or that person. And, and like, we want to shift the blame to anyone but ourselves. <laughs> and yet, you know, what do we see here? You know, it's, did God do an injustice by requiring in his law what we're unable to do? Like, you know, if, if he created us as these, these horrible, foul, wretched people, then he has no right to to accuse us, so I should be able to live my life the way that I want to live my life because that's just the way he made me. It's not my fault, it's his fault. No, no, no you see, God created us. He created us in his image. He created us to be perfect. You know, he, God created humans with the ability to keep the law. That's how he made us in, in, like in, in our creation. That was our ess essence. And yet, temp being tempted by the devil in reckless obedience, rob themselves and all their descendants of these gifts. And so we can't even put all the blame on Satan. That, yeah, I mean, he definitely played a part in it. He, he, he brought temptation where there might have not been temptation previously, or he helped to fan the flames of the temptations that were already there, but ultimately, what does it say? Adam and Eve, they rob themselves. So when we sin, that's our sin. We can't shift the blame onto somebody else. And we need to all be able to acknowledge that, yes, there are sins that other people do to us. There are hardships that we experience because of other people's wickedness. And yet all of us contribute to the wickedness of this world. We, we all add to it. And that's where question and answer 10, you know, it's, it's about the sin we are born with as well as the sin we personally commit. We all add to the troubles of this world. We can't shift the blame onto other people. Yeah. As far as real world problems, we sin against each other too. And in society, we have a justice system as well. And we're called on by God to be merciful to people that have sinned against us too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I would definitely say that's, that's true. That, you know, the, 
but yeah, you know, all, all of our sins, you know, they, they bear a burden to, to God, but a lot of our sins <laughs> create a burden yeah, between us. Yeah, you're saying that, you know, we, so one of the ways that, that we see, see mercy in our justice system is a way that, that you know. Yeah, so first time offenders, when there is, is repentance or remorse, you know, we show, you know, we, we show more flexibility with those. And, yeah, I, I would say that's true. And, uh. And, and even just in, in the way that we, we deal with each other as, as individuals, that um, to, to try to be able to, I mean, it is, it's one of those difficult things to try to figure out when, when we're dealing with people who harm us. You know, how, how do we balance, you know, justice and, and wrath? Um, well, that's where, you know, that, that verse uh, from, from Hebrews 10, verse 30 where it says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And the, again, the Lord will judge his people. You know, it's that, that trust that, you know, you know what? Well, it seems that, you know, God is pointing us towards, if we're going to be, if we ourselves are going to be demonstrating, you know, justice or mercy and trying to figure out that balance, um, you know, he's calling us more to that, that side of, of mercy. You know, the, the governments have been put into place, have been given the power of the sword to do the work of justice, but we as the church, we as individuals, representatives of God, you know, we're called to, to show mercy. And that can be hard, depending on the kinds of injustice that people have done to us and trying to know, you know how to balance that right. But, yeah, but you, know, you bring up a good point. So, uh, another another problem that I see being helped by these answers is helping us to see that you know there, there's not two different gods in the Bible. It's one of the things I've, I've heard people say over the years is, well, you know, you've got, you got in the Old Testament, you've got the God of wrath. In the New Testament, you have the God of mercy and act like there's, there's, no, there's no mercy in the Old Testament and there's no wrath in the New Testament and but think of like, well, what about the example of Ananias and Sapphira who you know, were, were the first people to, to lie in their tithes to the church and drop dead right there? You know, you can't say there's, there's no wrath in the, in the New Testament. Or, you know, when you look at the way that, you know, God time and time again rescued Israel from their cycle of sin and rebellion. Are you telling me that there was, there was no mercy? Every generation he had to pour out his mercies upon them again. So we see is that God is the same God, the true God, is perfect in justice, but also perfect in mercy. That is who he is, that has never changed, that has always been a part of his nature. So. Yeah, Daniel in the lion's den. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, a, that's a good example of justice and mercy being shown in, in one, one uh, historical event of you know, the, the, the mercy for, for Daniel and, and even for the, the king to be able to, to learn about the glory of the true God. And yet the advisors that had that sinister plot, they themselves ended up in the lion's den. And so you see you know, that justice taking place. Or, uh, even, or on that line, I think of uh, the, the book of, of Esther and you, and you get... Haman and, and his evil plot to, to destroy all, all the Jews, and, and you see just that, that turn of events that, that God had, had put together. I mean, it is just the, you know, the, the irony, or the, you know, I'm trying to think of it's probably a better word for it, but, and yeah? Thank you. Um, even with the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, yes. God shows mercy. Yeah. Joseph's uh, mercy to his family. Yes. And so it is demonstrated. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent point. I, I like the fact that you brought up that it, it wasn't just his own family, but you had people throughout the entire region who were not followers of Yahweh, that he showed mercy to, to them as well by blessing Israel's family. That's an excellent point. So, so, so along those lines also makes me think of, uh, of like with, 
with Jonah and Nineveh and like there you have people you know far off that God has this desire for that that city and for that generation to to be blessed and to be shown mercy and yeah I mean we can continue to to think of of great stories in the Old Testament of the the mercies of God but yeah those those were, were great examples so I appreciate that so so if you if you hear someone who uh who starts to, to push back on, oh, I, I don't know, I don't like the, the Old Testament. God's so mean in the Old Testament. Oh, no, no, no. Like, you know, they don't just bring up these, these stories. Like, no, like, read it. Like, actually go through it and read it, and you will see that, yes, there is judgment because we totally deserved it. And yet, look at this mercy of God that he poured out time and time again. And this is why we study all of the Bible, not just the New Testament. And so then that, that last question of, you know, are, are there any unanswered questions, things that were stirred up by Lord's Day 4 that aren't necessarily addressed or answered by it? Yep, Cohen? Was it uh, in the first one that when it said, no, God created humans with their ability to keep the law. They, however, tempted by the devil and reckless in disobedience, brought themselves to not their descendants that did. Was it some of these gifts that we couldn't do that was, that, that was brought to us, or all of these gifts? Um, I would say all the descendants, but, you know, that, but God still blesses us with a lot of gifts of, of his creation, because whether, whether we love Jesus or not, we can appreciate the sun that's shining right now, or yeah. you know, the, the water in, in the mountains, and you know, that's where you, know, you see that the, the, the rain falls on, um, you know, on the, the righteous as well as on, on the wicked. And so, but that's, that is a good, good question. You know, the nice thing of that us all being created in the image of God, that he, he still gives us gifts, but, but I think when, when we see the, the, the gift, I think the gift that's being referred to here is the gift of being able to keep the law. Because when we're born into sin, and then we can't, want to do what is right. And so this is one of, one of these points that uh, I won't go into St. Augustine's long explanation of it, but, um, but just that, that understanding of that when, when we are people who are born into sin, and, and if we have not had the Holy Spirit regenerating us, we have a free will. We have an ability to choose to do whatever we want to do, but no matter what it is that we want to do, it will always be sin. And so that's, I think that's the gift that, that we see is, is, uh, is what we lost through the sin of, of Adam and Eve. So that's a good question. Yeah, when, when, when they were created, there was only one rule. What's that? When they were created, there was only one rule. Oh, yeah, there's only one rule. Don't eat of the tree. Yeah. And then once sin came in, there had to be a lot more rules so we understood what sin was. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and isn't that just human nature in a nutshell, though? There's only one rule. Like, it's just like, look, I've created all this beautiful, uh, beautiful, you know, this beautiful garden, this beautiful world. Look at all these, these trees and plants that have these amazing fruits. Just don't eat that one. You know, what did we do? There was no stealing, there was no murder, there was no lying. Yeah. And now we have to live for all of these. Yeah, because now we, we've... Because we've corrupted that one gift of, of God, we've now been able to find ways to corrupt every good gift that God gives us. So that is a good point. So, so oh, Cohen, you got another one? Well, I just kind of find the joke about like what would happen if they ate the fruit from the tree. What if instead of just, what if they just got a worm in their apple instead? Yeah, well, that would have been a much better alternative if God had put, put a worm in there, but... Yeah, worm in the apple, which then also you know brings up the the, the whole thing. So I know like in, in cartoons and pictures we always make it look like an apple, um, but we know that it wasn't actually an apple. But it creates that curiosity in my mind of what did the fruit look like on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Like I, I have I've no idea. Pretty amazing. I, I mean yeah I mean if if they were willing to risk everything to eat that fruit. <laughs> Yeah. I'd at least hope it would have tasted good, but I don't know. He thought it was going to be good for knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, real, the real temptation, you're, you're right, the real temptation was, was less in, in the fruit and more in, in, the, uh, in the, the allure of being like God. But still... There you go. There you go. All right. Well, let me uh, let me move us to our uh, give a quick prayer for a conversation, then move us on to our action prayers. But uh, dear Heavenly Father, we we do we do acknowledge our sin and we repent of the fact that we are the ones who have brought so much evil and brokenness into this earth, and so we. We thank you so much for your mercy and your grace that you pour out upon us. Help us to, to honor you for your mercy. Let us delight in what you are creating within us so that, so that we would be able to, to make this world look a little more like what you had created to be as we wait for the day when Jesus comes back and finishes that good work, paying, or wiping away all the evils and the pains of this world so that we would be able to live and rejoice with him forever. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. And now, my friends, if you would turn into uh, page 813 in the Grace Psalter hymnal. 813. I'm going to be reciting the Apostles' Creed together. And uh, one of the reasons I, and as you find it, please stand up. Uh, but one of the reasons why I want us to keep coming back to Apostles' Creed is because I want us to know this so well that uh, when we get to that point in life that we can't remember much else, I want us to be able to say these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as we go, my friends, we go with this blessing from Romans that says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us go in this peace.